maybe you can go into detail what what were the stages so so that so people understand in in rocketry when you build rockets what are the stages so people understand that this kind of launch even if the rocket exploded afterwards it didn't land what type of success it is actually because yeah. first yeah. you test he the boosters then or the, the single parts and then you go to launching yes. the thing and then yeah so it, it's basically you know the integrated test flight is what it is so it, it's the first time they integrate the, the whole stack to get it fully integrated together to see whether everything works together so the first testing is like you test the raptor engines by themselves and then when you're confident that they they work well together you start putting them together because you are going to have a lot of resonance and every sort of other issues where the, you know, one Raptor by itself might perform really well, but when you put them together as a group, there may be some sort of issues and you have no idea what that's going to be. So you've got to test. And that's why they have these static fires and everything else. We put them on there, see how it performs. And then if the data looks good, then we're confident we can go ahead and launch. And they decided that rather than just launching the booster by itself, which is, you know, one possibility, they want to do it fully stacked. So that's why they wanted to put the Starship on top. Now, normally, you know, with NASA and in the past, when they, they, they do stuff like that, they're always a little bit nervous about putting it on there because the hardware they're putting is so expensive and they don't have another one to quickly replace it. They've got so many Starships around there. There's like just, and, and they have like, you know, warehouses full of Raptor engines. So it's not like they have a supply chain problem with those things. What the problem they have is they can't actually test them fast enough, the, the speed that they would like to do. So while it's sort of, you know, let's say sad to see this thing blow up and not be reused. Yeah. It wasn't intended to be reused anyways. You know, if it was a full success, they were going out into the Gulf and into the Pacific and that would be it. They probably weren't going to recover it or, or even attempt to, and definitely not to attempt to reuse because they just needed to find out, is the hardware flight proven? Is it going to work? What are going to be the failure points? And now we know what some of the failure points are. The failure points don't seem to be the Raptor engines. They performed really well on the way up. Hot staging is, I mean, the staging itself seems to have been successful. It worked. But the question is, did this using hot staging then result in problems later on? Mm -hmm. So, so everyone knows what's going on with the hot staging is that the second stage engines are lighting up while it's still connected to the first stage. Usually you don't do that. You separate the two, you make sure there's a safe distance between them, and then you light up the second stage and then everything will be it. Now that's, You'd want to do that for two reasons. One, you don't want to damage the booster because the booster is going to be in the direct line of sight of that engine plume. It's going to be taking all the heat and pressure and everything else from that. So that could cause damage to it, especially if you want it to be reusable. Then there's the other possibility that there could be blowback and everything else from doing that, that could actually impact and hurt the second stage. So those are the two dangerous. So why do you go ahead and, and do something like hot staging? Two reasons. One of them is to mitigate what they call gravity losses. So as long as you're not thrusting, so if you're not producing at least one G of, of acceleration or thrust, you're going to start decelerating and losing velocity, which you do not want to do. And as soon as you lose that velocity, you have to make it back up. So that means all the fuel that you're spending to get up to some speed, suddenly it, you're going back down and I have to make it up again in order to, to get up to where you want to go. So that's a loss. And if you can continue that, it makes it a lot easier to, to achieve orbital velocity. And that's why they want to do this trick. The other is this thing called propellant settling. And that as soon as you're weightless, and I think everyone will have an example. Have you ever been on like a, a trampoline or an elevator, like when the elevator quickly goes down, mm -hmm. you notice that they talk about how like, oh, suddenly my stomach is in my throat. You know, this feeling that all your stomach mm -hmm. contents like want to move up like that. Well, that's what's happening with a rocket. As soon as the thrusting stops, the propellant unsettles, which means it just starts like moving around inside the tank. And you can remember the tank is near empty at this point. So when we, so the part that's empty in your container, you know, quote, empty is what's called ullage. And then the other part is sort of what's filled. And the ullage isn't necessarily empty in the sense that it's a vacuum. Something else has to replace this fluid that's gone. And so you fill it with some sort of gas. And usually there's an ullage gas, which would be like helium, which is what they use in the Falcon 9. And that fills up the empty space and acts as a pressurant because it's very important that you have to maintain pressure throughout the tank or the tank will collapse on itself. Same thing with a beer can. You know, you take a beer can and when the beer can is full, it's very difficult to crush because it's filled with a fluid and the fluid is incompressible and it won't crush. But once you empty the contents of that, you go and you can crush the beer can like that really easily. So it is in a sense, if you take the, the super heavy booster and you were to shrink it down to the same size as a beer can, 
the thickness of the walls of that booster will be thinner than the thickness of the walls in your beer can. Okay. Yes. Wow. And, and so to, you, to, yes. to save weight and oh yes, God. just okay. to save weight. Now it's something like about four millimeters is the actual thickness, you know, which is think about it, given the size of it, it's only four millimeters and your beer can is already pretty thin. So you're getting thinner than that. Now, the reason why they can get away with it is that your beer can is made out of aluminum and this is made out of stainless steel, but still you have to make sure it's, you have the pressure in there. Otherwise it's going to collapse upon itself. Um, so SpaceX has been trying to get rid of as many parts as possible. And the pressure they are using in this case is actually the superheated gases of the either the propellant, in this case, uh, methane, or the oxygen that's used to cool the engines. They recycle it and bring it in and they pump it back into the top of the chamber. And so that will, will pressurize it because now you have this hot gas, which will kind of expand. Mm -hmm. The problem is that hot gas is coming in contact with like this really cold liquid down there. So you have an interface. And if you think about it, if you remember the, when they started out yesterday's live stream, mm -hmm. you saw like that fog that was along mm -hmm. the ground and everything. I mean, that's what happens when warm, moist air comes in contact with cold water, with a liquid, yeah. is that you end up getting this vapor layer. That basically means you're getting condensation. That means things are cooling down. So you've got uh, a couple of things you're concerned with. One is the, the propellant settling. As soon as you go weightless, turn off the engines, the propellant is moving up in the, uh, in the void and is basically floating around in there. And you need to get it back down to the bottom because down at the bottom is where the intake valves are. Yes. And if it's not there, then there's nothing to be able to go in there. Plus you need to push it down with a propellant. The other problem is that you have this danger of settling or, oh, sorry, ullage collapse. And what the ullage collapse means is that if I have a container where the lower part of the container is, let's say has ice cold water in it, in the upper part of, of my bottle, I actually put a very warm gas in there. And then I, I seal my bottle off. Okay. And now it's okay because the top of the bottle is still kind of warm, it's creating enough pressure for it to go out. If I then shake the bottle like that, suddenly that warm gas up there is going to chill and potentially um, precipitate out. In, in other words, condense. And that means a lot of the gas I had up there suddenly turned into liquid. And that mm -hmm. knocks down the amount of pressure that you have, as well as the fact that now that warm gas is now very cold and suddenly you can get the, the container to collapse. So that's what they call ullage collapse. And that's like one of the concerns and why you want to constantly thrust because you mm -hmm. do not get the propellant settling and you do not get ullage collapse. So with that long-winded explanation, what actually ended up happening at, at some point? So the, the hot staging worked pretty well. And you'll see that the, they had to create a ring in between the two stages. And that ring has these large vents in it. And those vents sort of allowed the exhaust plume from the second stage to vent out through there. Otherwise you would get an overpressure and everything would explode. You have no choice but to do that. And they had to hold it on for a certain amount of time because it gets really tricky. You've got 33 Raptors and it's getting close to empty that tank. And then they shut it down to only three Raptors and three Raptors at 50% because that's a about, you can go a little bit lower on the deep throttle, but right around 50%. And that means the whole stack is still accelerating. And when it's still accelerating, you do not get the propellant settling. You don't have to worry about that. Now you light up the second stage. And so it's happening there and it's pushing back a little bit on the first stage, but it's not really, it's still connected. So it's, it hasn't been released yet, but you have to wait till all six of those engines get up to, to adequate thrust, probably full thrust. And then at that point, you, you release the stack and that means the second stage is going to pop away. Okay, so the first stage has been responsible for accelerating the whole stack. So it's still got enough thrust, it's accelerating the whole stack. And at this point, the heaviest part of that stack is probably the second stage because it's got all of its fuel in there. Mm -hmm. And the first stage is just about empty. So as soon as you pop back, and there's that possibility that you get like a little bit of an overpressure, like anything, so it's going to pop out like a, shank, like a champagne cork along with its own thrust. And you hope that it continues to accelerate away fast enough because now you get this first stage that suddenly is like near empty and you have these things here that were lifting something really heavy and now suddenly that's going to want to accelerate so that booster is going to start to accelerate faster now and you're going to make sure that the second stage is moving faster away accelerating faster away so you've got to, and that's why they had to have all six engines they couldn't say well let's just separate with three engines to make it a little bit easier and we'll turn on the other ones a little bit later it's like nope that's what it says to be able to do it now there was this problem uh, with what you're talking about here with the blowback. 
So what's going to happen is that when that thing kind of pops out and it releases, there's going to be a sudden force on the first stage to push it back down. And it looks like they may not have had quite enough thrust. So Scott Manley went through and he thinks he detected, I'm going to try to look at it as well, that it appears that the, the speed of, of the booster, it actually slowed down faster than you would have with, with gravity. So he suspects that what happened is you get a little bit of ullage collapse, potentially, or at least propellant unsettling when that happened. So it sort of pushed down momentarily for a very short period of time. And the question was like, was that enough to kind of disrupt what was going on in there? Yeah. And then they needed to light up all of the engines. Oh, not all of them, all the inner engines. So you've got an outer ring of engines and those cannot gimbal, but everything interior can gimbal. And, and with that, they have like a lot of control and they do not have any reaction control system on the booster to be able to reorient it. The whole idea is they're trying to get rid of all of the extra mass that they can and, you know, unnecessary parts, see what you can do. So they said, well, we actually have rocket engines on there that we can use to flip it around and we'll just go ahead and use those, but we're going to have to gimbal them. And in order to, I guess, do the maneuver quick enough, they needed to light up all the engines. And then you see, they couldn't get them all to light up. So what I suspect happened is that, you know, if you take in somewhere, you know, I wasn't prepared here, I should have got a, a bottle of water that, you know, if you take a bottle of water and you hold it this way, everything is going to be nice and all right. But if you kind of turn it horizontally, suddenly it's settling this way, isn't it? So you can imagine that one part of your bottle of water is submerged and the other part of the bottom is not. And each of those has got an intake around there for all of them. So that means some of them were literally starved. It's like, hey, there's no nothing for us to consume here. And the others were like happily getting whatever they needed going out through there. So that might explain a reason why all those engines out were kind of on the same side. And it seems to have knocked out one of the center engines as well, which is like, well, wait a minute, it was already firing all right, so there, there shouldn't be any problem with, with a startup. It probably means it was starved. The other thing you have to be careful of is that, again, why, with the propellant settling or unsettling, when it goes up, it means the stuff below it gets kind of filled in with the gas below it. Yeah. And if that's at the intakes, it gets sucked into the intake. And you know, it's like you don't want bubbles in, in your gasoline flow and in, in your internal combustion engine, that's not good. And it's also not good for a rocket. So if you are ingesting gas rather than fluid coming on in there and you have these turbines that are spinning really fast and suddenly this bubble comes through there, they overspin like that. And when that happens, then your power head decides to rud and then things aren't good after that. So that probably is a good explanation of what happened around there and why things were not going well. Now, that did not cause the destruction of the first engine of the first stage. It was probably the, the automatic flight termination system, or sometimes it's called the, the FTS. It does not appear that SpaceX intentionally said, okay, we're going to self-destruct it right now and push a button in mission control. It was a decision made on there because it probably detected something was going wrong with the vehicle at that point, and it just went. And you can see how quickly it went. And I'm pretty sure a lot of other people are pretty sure it was probably the FTS that did it because you can see one frame where everything is okay. And then if you just go through one frame at a time, 30 seconds later, you will see a little plume right in the middle, which is where the FTS would be that oh, probably triggered okay. it. And then one frame later, you see it get much bigger. And then one more frame after that, it's, it's a big sphere. It's, it's, it's a fireball. So it seems to be about where you would have the FTS system set there in order to make the charge between the bulkheads to have it go. The other possibility is that there is, there's a lot of external plumbing that goes up and down the ship for like the autonomous, um, that maybe one of those somehow failed or something like that. What they call like the downcomers that are along there could maybe have had some sort of failure going on there for other reasons. But I, I suspect that it was actually FDS that went ahead and did it because it just blew too quickly. A lot of times you would see like some other trail or something going on in there while it's waiting to get kind of enough to get that big bang coming out of it. Yeah. But yeah, it, it looked like it was that. 